Today's guest is a true American hero, Casey Campbell, retired Air Force colonel, and an A-10 pilot who pulled off a miraculous landing over Baghdad. But before we dive into her incredible story, I wanted to remind you to check out her Stories of Survival episode that just dropped yesterday on the Black Rifle Coffee Company YouTube channel. Also, don't forget to head over to BlackRifleCoffee.com to check out our delicious coffee blends apparel and gear that supports our nation's veterans and first responders. All right, let's get started with the show. Kim, thank you so much for taking the time and coming out to Heber City. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So you retired out of the Air Force Academy, right? I did. I retired about a year and a half ago. My last assignment was at the Air Force Academy. I was the director for the Center for Character and Leadership Development. So going back where I started. I, I, yeah, I, that's interesting to me. Like that whole full spectrum experience sounds fascinating out store, outside of the story of Survivor we're going to talk about. It's so fascinating that you started, you graduated at Air Force Academy and and then you had this whole entire career and you were able to like bring all that experience back and teach it. How was that for you as a transition? Yeah, definitely a full circle life moment. I mean, I got my start at the Air Force Academy, but to come back, I don't, it, the Academy is one of those places where like, I don't ever want to go through it again. It yeah. was my, much nicer coming back as a, yeah. as a graduate and as an instructor. Um, but be, to be able to come back and share kind of my stories and those lessons that I had learned along the way to talk to our next generation of leaders, of aviators, and just kind of share some of those, you know, things that you don't learn at school, that you don't read necessarily in the books, to share some of those things with them and one, get them excited about what they're going to do, about the incredible opportunities, but also the challenges that they're going to face and just sharing a little bit of the things that I went through and some of the challenges that I faced. I think... Um, you know, it's, it was exciting to be back. It was exciting. It was just heartwarming to see that really our next generation, they're just as excited about service as we all were. Uh, yeah. And it was a great experience. And that certainly gives you an optimistic view of the future. Cause I know a lot of people have, they think like, Hey, there's not people willing to step up and serve because the politics, the social situation in the country, whatever's going on in the country. But what I've always found is profoundly there's always a segment of the population that's willing to volunteer and step above and beyond that volunteer service and do profound things. And, you know, the, for, for those who don't know what the Air Force Academy is, they're grooming, mentoring, and teaching some of the, mo the biggest leaders in the military period across the Air Force, of course, but across the military, right? Yeah, and, I mean, these are going to be our next leaders. And, um, you know— Yes, times have changed and there are different challenges, but in the sense of service, they're still just as committed to serve, just as excited to serve. And these are our future air and now Space Force leaders. I forgot about the Space Force yeah. thing. <laughs> go down a rabbit hole on that. Um, that's really cool, though. I mean, I like, yeah, the, the job in an A-10 cockpit doesn't change much as compared to even when you grew up in the Air Force. I, I'm sure... Um, you know, we're going to focus on the story of survival, but I'm interested to hear how did you get into the role? One, back in the 2000s, when you graduated the Air Force Academy in, in the late 90s, there wasn't a lot of female pilots, period, I imagine. I, I remember that time period. I, that's when I came into the Army, mm -hmm. and I was in the Q course during your story of survival. But what made you, what prompted you to want to be in a cockpit and fly in a combat platform? So I actually decided that I wanted to be a fighter pilot in 1986 oh, wow. uh, when I was 10 years old. Wow. It actually started because as a fifth grader, I was watching the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger. And I watched that too yeah, as a child. I think yeah. we all, Live. many of us yeah. watched it in the classroom. And of course, it was exciting and exhilarating at first. And then to watch kind of the devastation play out. But there was something about that moment for me and watching it. And I remember watching it back with my mom. And, you know, I was devastated in that moment and for whatever reason it just kind of hit me that these astronauts died doing something that they believed in something that was big and important something that was more important than themselves and at that age I decided that's what I wanted to do I originally wanted to be an astronaut and after talking to my parents they said well a lot of the astronauts are pilots you might consider going to the Air Force Academy but again I was 10 right so I think my dad was like well We'll see about this. this. We'll see how much this sticks. And I was, I was committed. I mean, for me, it wow. flipped a switch. I decided that that's what I wanted. I totally changed my behavior at school and my extracurricular activities. And uh, 
it didn't change from that point on. I'd say the only caveat is at that point, I didn't know that women couldn't be fighter pilots. So in 1986, the rules were that women were not allowed to be fighter pilots. Thankfully, that changed by the time I graduated high school. But by the time I went to the academy, by the time I was going to pilot training, there were very few women so flying new. fighters at the time. Yeah, yeah, especially an analog combat platform like the A-10, yeah. right? Which is completely, for, for people who don't understand like the difference and variations of platforms, uh, there was a time when the A-10 was going to be cut from the club. They were saying, hey, we don't need this thing. It's like, I remember that time as a child and then as a Green Beret, looking back and going, thank God we didn't get rid of that platform. Yeah. And, but it's a, a, a very analog platform as compared to some of the fast movers. How did you end up in the seat of an A-10 through your experience? Well, once I got to pilot training, I knew I knew I wanted to fly a fighter of some sort. I didn't really know what I wanted to fly at that point. And as I got through pilot training, I realized, one, I really enjoyed the low-level missions. They were a lot of fun. But then I started talking to other pilots um, and listening about the mission and hearing about the things that they did. And, you know, keep in mind, this is pre-9-11, um, so the mission set was a little bit different. But... The idea of close air support and supporting our troops on the ground and knowing that what I did in the airplane could make a difference, could help guys get home safely, like to me that was a mission I could get on board with. Um, so I just, I love the idea of the A-10. I thought it had a great mission uh, and uh, I knew it would also help me fly low level missions. <laughs> it wow. would be a lot of fun too. That's awesome. And were you a FAC, uh, a Ford Air Control uh, pilot or A-10 pilots? FAC uh, qualified to call their own cast, or how does that work? Uh, so some pilots are qualified for forward air control. We don't. We have a, a decent number, but we have we didn't really use it a whole lot. Yeah. Um, it kind of depended upon the the situation, um, but only a certain number of pilots are qualified for that in each unit. Yeah, and so when 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 you were in the Air Force Academy and graduated, and then as you get as you become an A10 pilot. We're talking about like right before 9-11, you're a qualified A-10 pilot, yeah. and then 9-11 happens. Where were you on 9-11? I was in A-10 training. I was actually asleep. Uh, I was on crew rest for a, a night flight, and I remember one of the guys in my squadron uh, called, and I was trying to figure out why I was breaking my crew rest and because uh, he knew I was flying nights, and he was like, Kim, you got to turn on the TV, and I remember turning on the TV in the, the Q room at davis Monthan and uh, watching the second aircraft hit the World Trade Center. And I think I knew immediately we were under attack. I mean, there was no doubt at this point in my mind. And I think it was just this realization that my life as an A-10 pilot, my life as an Air Force officer was going to change dramatically. Um, I think we all knew it. I think uh, we, we all went into the squadron at that point, And a lot of guys in the squadron had parents that were airline pilots or worked at the Pentagon and it just felt very personal all of a sudden. And, uh, I think it was just for us, we knew it was a matter of time. Wow. You're talking about timing and a really crossroad of your life, right? 9-11, yeah. you're, you're wrapping up a 10 pilot school. Um, what's your combat rotation out the gate? Was it Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. And I imagine it had to have been early 02 or, or I'm sorry, late uh, early 02, right after 9-11, I imagine that there's, there was cast there. Yeah, so I finished my A-10 training after we got back in the air and uh, I made it to Pope Air Force Base in North Carolina, uh, December of 01. Uh, there for a couple months, did a quick spin up, got checked out, combat mission ready, and then we turned and deployed to Afghanistan in early 2002. So, you know, talk about, you hope you did it all right in training, um, I think. You know, at the time, it's this idea that you're going to train for close air support. You're going to train for these worst case scenarios. You're going to train for those troops in contact missions and never really knowing if it's going to happen. 9-11 changed all of that. And all that training, it was like suddenly it was this realization of how ready we had to be. Like we, I showed up, spent a couple months in the squadron and we were deploying. I mean, that's how fast it happened. Wow. How was that first combat rotation for you? Was it a pinnacle moment in your life? Was it everything you expected it to be? Because I know like leading up to combat for the warfighter can have different emotions and you're in different position and place. How was that overall for you? Well, I think there was a part of us that I think we all wanted to go. It was like, you know, you 
you train and you train and you train. And, you know, if, if there were going to be troops on the ground, we wanted to be there. You know, it was, um, it was our really for most of the pilots in the squadron. There were, we had a few guys from Desert Storm, but for a lot of the pilots in the squadron, it was a first deployment just based on kind of the situation at the time. And I think we all wanted to be there. Uh, we started out in Operation Southern Watch in Kuwait, and then we slowly started rotating through, moving troops, moving personnel, moving airplanes into Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. Uh, my first combat mission was relatively quiet. In fact, many of the missions that I flew on that very first deployment, very quiet, a lot of uh, convoy escort, a lot of just being overhead. I will tell you that initially it was kind of like, is this all we're doing? You know, just we felt like kind of flying circles in the sky. And then we had one mission where it was a convoy and, uh, you know, they checked in and they were just telling us they were going to their next FOB. Um, and it was this idea of like, you could hear the fear in their voice. They like had expected a potential ambush and, and they didn't have a qualified controller. And it was just all of a sudden, it was like you realize that just by being overhead, even though we weren't really doing our primary mission, we were there to support, you know, we were there to provide that overwatch. If something happened, we would be there and we would be ready. So it changed my mindset a little bit about what we were doing. Um, but that's that was the majority of those missions in Afghanistan, relatively quiet, uh, just being overhead, providing overwatch and support in case it was needed. Yeah, it's, we didn't have a profound presence in Afghanistan at that period, kind of occupying, developing fire bases and evolving the strategy on the ground. And a lot of support that we had early on was for specific raids, mm -hmm. for specific targeting of specific guys, Operation Anaconda, some of those things that took place. Um, I imagine as things evolved, that became a complete different dynamic, right? I mean, I, I mean, man, I've, I've used A-10 so many times. I was, I was, a, I was actually a Special Operations Tactical Air Controller, Terminal Air Controller mm -hmm. is the schoolhouse I went to for a period of time in my career. And um, A-10s, they were the most active on the battlefield because we couldn't depend, especially in low-lying areas around mountains and even in urban areas especially. Yeah. We needed, we couldn't wait for a three-minute loiter for an F-16 <laughs> to come back around. You're like, three minutes, bro. It would be over in three minutes. Um, so... So I, I, that's profound because you got some combat experience before we go into this April of 2003 campaign. Mm -hmm. um, what was the initial deployment for Afghanistan out, outside of coming back from a, uh, Af Afghanistan and going into Iraq? Because you come back and you're like, all right, so what's next? <laughs> then we're invading Iraq. Yeah, well, we got home and, you know, there's a fairly standard rotation and we thought we would be home for a while. In fact, so much so that they sent my husband uh, and I both to squadron officer school uh, at Maxwell Air Force Base in January of Because your husband's an A-10 pilot He's well. A-10 pilot. Yeah. Uh, we had spent a lot of time apart already, so this was an opportunity for us to go to school together. But as we're sitting at Maxwell, like, Iraq is spinning up. We can, we like, we're listening to the news and we're like, we are going to be stuck at Maxwell. Like, our squadrons are going to deploy gonna and we're going to miss the war because <laughs> we're going to be at Maxwell at Squadron Officer School. And, uh, you know, we're happy to be there together, but both of us, you know, all our special operators are getting pulled out. Like, you can just see it coming. And uh, we got home and got word that my squadron was going uh, again. And uh, I think I packed my bags and was gone in a week. Um, wow. and, uh, my husband, uh, instead of going to fly, he was in a separate squadron. Uh, he deployed forward, um, with special forces to work as essentially an air liaison officer, uh, air support, uh, on the ground, not his first choice, uh, but with guys that he knew and, and, uh, obviously respected. So, uh, it was just this eye-opening turn of events for me. Uh, we had already landed in Kuwait a year prior before we moved on to Afghanistan, but returning to Kuwait at Al Jaber Air Base, totally different story. Now the ramp is lined as far as you can see. There's, uh, I think, Marine F-18s there, uh, A-10s, multiple squadrons, rescue helicopters. I mean, it's it's clear, like the buildup is coming. And uh, I think we, we all knew that war was on the way. Um, wow. it, it just a totally different environment, different feel, different, just different resources, but just a different feel for what we were about to do. Yeah. And I imagine strategically the A-10 
played a significant role in both the planning and tactical operations on the ground because it was designed for that war, right? An anti-tank uh, operation and, you know, how that unfolded um, is pretty insane compared to the Gulf, I remember the Gulf War and how that kind of unfolded with Apaches and, and A-10s. When you look at the push into the country, did you do the actual invasion leading up? So you actually pushed in with the main forces yeah. and established the base? And that, well, um, it was eye-opening. I and mean, once we, once our troops crossed the line from Kuwait into Iraq, I mean, I remember this, one of the first sorties I think I flew and there was just this dust trail. I mean, this constant stream of vehicles. I think initially there wasn't a lot of resistance and our troops were moving fast and, uh, you know, we're hanging out overhead kind of waiting. Um, but again, it was, it was, you know, plus or minus a few uh, scenarios. Initially, it was fairly quiet. We were just kind of hanging out overhead, taking out known weapons locations, known kind of tank buildup areas. That, Predetermined targets. Yeah, yeah. And then even though there were tanks and things there, that there was nobody in them anymore. I mean, it was just, um, I mean, there were a lot of uh, kind of empty targets. Um, that was our initial kind of thrust into on our way to Baghdad. As as they got closer to Baghdad, obviously things changed dramatically. Yeah. So take me to that day, like starting that day, I believe it was April 7th, mm -hmm. 2003. Take me to that day. And did you get briefed that this was a deliberate operation? Did you get briefed uh, that potentially there was threats? How was that day leading up in planning pre-flight before you got inside the aircraft? Yeah. Um, April 7th, I think, was a lot like many other days where we would get the briefing of the threats in the area. I mean, we knew uh, by this point we had gotten very close to Baghdad and we knew that it was surrounded by what we called at the time the super mez, the super missile engagement zone. And there were so many threats surrounding Baghdad, so we knew what we were going into. Uh, we we had obviously some support assets that would help kind of take out those threats or at least um, reduce them before we went in, but we knew the threats going in. We got a brief from our um, ground liaison officer uh, there about kind of the scheme of maneuver, what was going on, where the forward line of troops was, which at this point was a little sketchy because it was <laughs> really a little bit of everywhere. Uh, we also got a briefing from the Marine talk just to understand where they were pushing as well. Uh, so we kind of understood what was going on on the, the ground battle space um, and also the threats for us. But our standard practice at this point was to fly our A-10s up to Baghdad. We would air refuel. It's an hour flight in the A-10, so it takes up a lot of gas. So we would air refuel when we get there. And then we would just wait. We would wait in these stacks. So they, because of the situation on the ground, they would just stack up aircraft all over Baghdad, kind of north, south, east, west stacks and just wait for a tasking. And uh, unfortunately, April 7th, the weather was terrible. We couldn't see the ground below, and A-10A at the time, uh, we really needed to get below the weather if we were going to be effective. Uh, and I remember my flight lead just saying, well, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to do anything today. You know, just if we can't get below the weather, you know, what are we gonna be able to do? Um, we got a call pretty quickly when we were in the stack. It was initially to go proceed towards an area where they thought some tanks and vehicles were acting as a command post. And then we started pressing that way and immediately uh, got a call over the radio from a ground controller. Troops are taking fire and they need immediate assistance. Wow. So it began out, it began as, as routine as it could yeah. be in providing close air support. Um, let me ask you a question. Prior to this event, have you had any close calls that would elicit the similar responses that you would have in the aircraft during this period of time? Or is everything pretty fairly normal up until this point? Everything's pretty fairly normal, hmm, at, least in, at least in my perception. I hadn't flown at night yet, so I didn't realize how much they were actually shooting at us because we couldn't see it as yeah. much in the day. Uh, but everything up to this point was fairly straightforward, fairly normal, kind of followed all of our standard training procedures. It was... Uh, fairly normal i would say in terms of close air support as normal as it gets so you're 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 moving deliberately to to somebody who's called for close air support mm -hmm. because their troops in contact yes uh, walk me through that process and then how was it arriving on scene 
and then walk me through the initial contact that you made. Yeah. So, I mean, started out relatively normal in terms of a troops in contact, just in terms we got a description of the situation. Unfortunately, we couldn't see the ground below. So all we see is clouds and we're just at this time plotting everything on our paper maps. We're given, yeah, that's what we got for technology. No, no, we had binoculars. We had binoculars, (laughs) yeah. Space stabilized binoculars, yep. (laughs) (laughs) While while you're flying. It's like an M5 binoculars, wow. Uh, binoculars and paper maps. We have red grease pencils. So I, I'm, I'm pulling out my map and marking with red grease pencil where the enemy is. Wow. Um, and uh, friendlies uh, with the black grease pencil. It's high tech. Uh, so cool. But uh, we're told the friendlies are on the west side of the Tigris River. It's uh, third ID. They're on the west side of the Tigris River. And then the enemy, which we find out is uh, Iraqi Republican Guard, is on the east side of the Tigris River. They're firing rocket propelled grenades into our troops. And they tell us that the our target is underneath, we called it the North Baghdad Bridge at the time. It's not an official name, but that's what we called it, uh, the North Baghdad Bridge. And our, our target is enemy underneath the bridge. Uh, so we're kind of talking through that. I, I think on the positive, that's a kind of a strange word to use, but on the positive side, like you don't normally get a nice river to identify friendly for an, from enemy. Yeah. So, I mean, at least we have that going, that there is a very identifiable identifiable feature um so we kind of have a picture of what this looks like but we're still looking at our paper maps in your head on the paper topographically but you can't literally see cannot see any of it because of the the cloud because of the clouds and um, my flight lead says all right we're gonna go proceed right over the top of the target area and then we'll just find some holes in the clouds and and dive through um wow yeah, so he walks through our, our, our planning. We're going to do what we call wedge shooter's gun. So I'm going to be about a mile in trail on him and kind of an offset position. And uh, we're both set up to do a guns attack so that we can use forward firing to get right underneath the bridge. Um, but I again, I still can't see the ground below. And I look over and I watch him just, he kind of rolls inverted and dives through the clouds and he's gone. So he commits based on the map, based on his understanding where he thinks he is, he commits to an inversion through the cloud coverage to go in for a deep dive gun run. We, we can kind of see the ground below. So yeah, we, but that's we can ballsy. Kind of <laughs> well, like you're. <laughs> it's a troops in contact, though. Is this the first? Is this the first commitment? Is this the first gun run that you've ever made? It is not, but it yeah. is the first troops in contact. Daylight. Uh, yeah, and prior to this, I had done had uh, dropped bombs and shot the gun and a few other um, weapons, but I hadn't had not been in a troops in contact scenario yet. Where bad guys are shooting essentially back troops, and yeah. at troops. Yeah, and and at this point, we don't really know that they're shooting at us. Um, my flight lead drops below the weather, and he says, "All right, Casey," which is my call sign. He says, "It's your turn." come on down. And he said, when you get down below the weather, stay on the west side. So I just, you know, I looked down, find a little hole in the clouds and drop through. But as soon as I got below the weather, um, which was lower than we normally are, uh, it was maybe surreal is the right word because it was like everything that we trained for, right? I, I could see the river, the Tigris River. I could see kind of the, where the friendlies would be. I could see where the enemy wouldn't be. I, we weren't that low. I couldn't actually see them. But um I can see tracers and smoke. I mean, it, I'd not been low enough to actually see that from the air before. So it's a little bit eye-opening, you know, as I'm trying to prep my airplane and find my flight lead. And it's all of these things are happening very quickly, but it's just, it's surreal because this is exactly what we train for. Um, and about that same time, I start to see like these puffs of smoke and now bright flashes and they're up in the air. Uh, and I'm realizing very quickly that not only is there this firefight happening across the river, but they're they're shooting up at us too. So what is the estimate of distance that you are above the ground in relationship to the bridge? Uh, we're about 7,000 feet um, altitude up yeah. in the air. Um, and we're just, you know, we're a couple miles offset. Um, so trying... you're by yourself. I mean, you're essentially in a pattern where there's nobody around you except for you. So you're very clear. Yeah, I mean, my flight, my flight lead is there with me, but uh, all the other assets are at this point above the weather. I mean, anybody else that's going to help us out is above the weather. And, uh, you know, it's just we know we have to get in there quickly. We also realize they're shooting at us, so we're trying to act quickly, 
kind of assess the risk. And my flight lead says, all right, we're going to do a couple passes. We're going to do gun and rockets. And he's in, you know, he's like, you know, communicating very quickly, but he sees what's going on and he's in and he comes in uh, north to south trying to get underneath the bridge. And uh, unfortunately, it wasn't effective. Um, he, uh, the ground controller said that it just based on where it was hitting coming in north to south. And so we said, all right, we'll set up south to north. And uh, but now we're very predictable because we're in from the south. And we're coming off west because that's where the friendlies are. So we're very predictable. We we understand that, but we're just trying to get in there, do two quick passes and kind of climb up, reassess, get our energy back and uh, see how things are going. So this is the second gun run that you're making. Well, this was his first. It wasn't effective. So now we're kind of setting up, re setting up again. Um, and uh, we end up doing two uh, two gun runs. And then we switched to rockets, our high explosive rockets, uh, again, forward firing to get underneath the bridge. Uh, my flight lead goes first, and then it's my turn, kind of my last pass. Uh, we're just, we, again, say this is our last pass. We're going to set up, kind of reassess. We put a 30 millimeter down on the enemy, and now rockets. We feel like we're in a pretty good position to kind of climb up just a bit, reassess, step away from the threat area. This but, is after you've already identified that you're getting shot at. Yes. You guys are committed to it. You're like, yeah. hey, we've weighed the risk. There's not a lot of mitigation of this risk. We have to commit here because these guys are in trouble. So even – what were the first indications that you were getting shot at? I imagine at the speed in which you're going, the distance from your position to the target, there are minimal understanding or observation of what gunfire means to you. What was the indications of that? Was it the flack that you were receiving? Was it the puffs of smoke? Yeah, we. I mean, we could see the triple A. We could. I mean, we could see it. Um, it wasn't like you know. A, a, it was kind of sporadic, if you will. So, I mean, we trained to this. This is we we trained to be able to maneuver our aircraft to avoid the triple A. Um, we trained to keep an eye out for missiles. We're watching. Uh, we have our systems that help us in that scenario, but. It's a troops in contact. We're going to do everything we can to get in there. That's part of the reason we said just two passes. We'll just do a, two passes, climb up, reassess, and come back in if we need to, and ideally try to change up our positioning a little bit. Yeah, uh, we knew we were predictable. Um, we it was a risk. It was a risk we were willing to take just because of the situation that was happening on the ground with our ground troops. So this is the third inbound. You're deciding to switch to rockets, and I imagine. Um, is that still a manual process? Is it fire, release, and that locks in for people who are listening to this? Or is it you have to be manually aligned on the target line, the gun target line, and then be able to send those rockets into that position? Yeah, so we we roll our nose. We have a symbology in our heads-up display, but we roll our nose to get right underneath the bridge. We're not, we're not going underneath the bridge, but we're aligned so that our nose is aiming right at the base of the bridge. Uh, and then we hit the weapons release button, and, and rockets is a case where it, it comes out instantly. They're okay. not locked onto anything. It's okay. just based on how you're pointing. The so aircraft. the trajectory is lined out. Once you send it, it's fire, forget. Correct. Wow. Okay. So walk me through that third gun run. Yeah. So this is my last pass. It's my second pass um, at this point. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I'm very concentrated on trying to make sure I'm in the right position just because I got to get right underneath the bridge um, with my aim point. Um, all while trying to keep my airplane maneuvering and, and I roll in, point my nose right underneath the bridge, fine tune my aim point and then hit the weapons release button. Uh, seven rockets instantly come down on the enemy location and our normal immediate reaction then is to pull up, get away from the ground, away from the threat, keeping my airplane maneuvering. Um, and that's when I feel and hear just this loud explosion at the back of the airplane. Was it, so you sent it and then you, you immediately go to move the plane, and that's when you start getting stitched up. Is that when you when you felt it, or were you still? Were you no, already climbing? No, I was kind of climbing out, trying to get my energy back. We're very heavy at the time. We're full of gas because we just air refueled. We're full of bombs and missiles, so we're heavy. Uh, we're climbing back up, and as I'm maneuvering in that climb, uh, left hand turn, and I just hear the loudest explosion. I knew immediately I was hit. That explosion, walk me through that explosion. How did that feel? And I, I've had 
you know, from a ground perspective, those loud explosions, I get chills myself thinking about RPGs impacting my vicinity or whatever. And it, it, it changes. It's like a, it is like a needle through a thread. It's like very pointed point in your life. When you heard that, what went through your head? Um, well, I think I said on the radio, oh shit, <laughs> is what I said. <laughs> Um, but I think before that I, you know, it was, I remember like this bright red, orange fireball, uh, kind of surrounding my airplane. It's hard to know what to equate it to. I think of like a high speed car crash where you, where you get rear ended because it was at the back of my airplane and it just, just dumped my aircraft nose low. Um, I feel like time slowed down a little bit. Like I could see Baghdad down below me. I remember kind of just this initial like ground is getting closer um, I instinctively just pulled back on the stick and that's when I realized that you know I pulled back and nothing happened you know wow. just this kind of emptiness um, you know and I, I think not very much time passed but I also remember looking down at my ejection handles because now that I know my airplane is not responding I'm thinking that's about the last thing I want to do is now pull the ejection handles and potentially end up floating down in a parachute into the hands of the enemy, like that's not going to go well. Um, so there are a lot of things going through my mind, but I think what I said on the radio was, oh shit, two got hit. Um, and, uh, you know, at that point, now it's just reaction, right? Training kicks in. I'm just kind of relying on all the training that had led me to this point, trying to get my airplane under control, trying to figure out what's going on. At the same time, my flight lead now knows what's happened. So he's talking to me over the radio. I'm somewhat listening because I'm totally focused on getting the airplane under control. But, you know, there's lots of things going on in the cockpit at this point. I've got master caution light flashing at me. And we have a caution panel over on the side here. And it's kind of more lights on it than I've ever seen other than when you shut down the airplane. Um, but I remember very quickly seeing that my hydraulics, both the pressure and reservoir lights were both on on the left and right side. Not a great indication. And then right above that is the hydraulic gauges and they were both at zero. So hydraulics are what we need to fly the airplane to control the airplane. And I am, I recognized immediately they were gone. Uh, so at this point, I just know that I've got two choices, eject, not a good one, and uh, get our jet into the emergency backup system, which is eventually what I did was flip that switch. And now, thankfully, the airplane started climbing again. Is the emergency backup system more analog? Is it like cable versus hydraulic? It is, yeah. It's it's like cables and pulleys. It's uh, wow. It is a mechanical manual backup mode. Um, our our airplane, the A10, is designed to take hits, right? So if we lose one hydraulic system, the other takes over. If you lose both, we have this emergency backup system. So that's what happened in my case. Hydraulics were dumped out when the missile hit the back of my airplane, and uh, uh, the only option I had at that point, other than ejecting, was going into this backup system. Now you say it's um, meant to take hits. I, I vaguely remember getting told that A-10s have armor integrated into the, the build of the plane? Is that yeah. true? Yeah, so the cockpit is surrounded with what we call the titanium bathtub. Mm. So our cockpit is surrounded by titanium so that it, prevent, it protects the pilot um, from potential damage. Um, we have a lot of, th you know, the, air, the airplane itself is very survivable. So all of our fuel tanks uh, are enclosed in this protective foam lining so that if you get hit with battle damage, it's the intent is to prevent a fire from happening. Uh, we've got two very reliable engines that are up a little higher than you would see on most airplanes, all, all designed for survivability. So this emergency back, backup system called manual reversion is exactly that. I mean, it's just the airplane was designed to take hits while performing its mission. Wow. What are your options at that point where you, you're figuring out like, hey, do I need to eject? There's Baghdad, there's handles, there's all of these emergency procedures that you got to go through. Um, at what point do you realize like, hey, I only have one option here is get back to base. Yeah. And if I don't get back to base, I'm not going to potentially survive. It's a matter of seconds. I mean, I, I it's kind of that quick. We go back to our training, which is maintain aircraft control. I can't. So I'm analyzing the situation, trying to figure out what the hell's going on uh, and then take action and flip the switch. So it's, it's seconds. I don't really know how long it took me, but um, I... I didn't want to eject. I mean, that was about the last thing uh, that I wanted to do. So I don't know what I would have done if uh, 
if I hadn't, you know, if the switch hadn't worked. But thankfully, I didn't have to think about that. So yeah. Um, so this is seconds. Seconds. All of this thing, all this information is processed. You go through. Uh, you basically revert back to training. We talk about that often at my company, Phil Kraus Survival. We say you're not typically going to rise to the occasion. You're going to fall back to your level of training. Yeah. And how important was that training for you in allowing you to survive in that worst case scenario? It, it was huge because in that, you know, in that time frame, roughly 20 seconds, because all I have is when I say that I'm hit and when I know that I tell my flight lead that I'm in this backup system. So somewhere in that time frame, I make the decision, but um, I, I didn't have time to ask for help. There was no like conversation back and forth about what I was going to do. I didn't even, I couldn't open a checklist. I mean, I was just trying to get the airplane under control. So it was 100% fall back on my training. Um, you know, I think about in a moment when you're faced with fear, even though I didn't know that I was scared at the time, but you know, when you're faced with that fear, kind of that overwhelm where everything is going wrong, I went back to everything that I had done in training. I mean, we had prepared for this mission. We talked about what happens if you get battle damage. It's one of the things that we train to do in a simulator. We practice it on our previous rides. We talk about it in our briefing. We, you know, we have a solid game plan. It's also one of those things you think about, you're like, oh, that'll never happen to me, right? Mm -hmm. You just, that won't happen. But it did, you know, and thankfully I had paid attention in all the training. But, uh, <laughs> you know, just it was na it was such a natural reaction to kind of just it was like muscle memory. You know, I just fell back exactly on all the things that we had talked about. Wow. Um, crazy. Um, you get hit. And what's your actions after you post assess the damage, regain control of the aircraft? Do you do, you know, I think about under free fall, we do a penetration check mm -hmm. just to make sure we have the ability to get lift over that parachute. Yeah. Did you, did you have to do that? And then what were your de determining factors now? Was it, hey, RTB, we got to get back home? Yeah, eventually we went through a lot of emergency checklists, but it, my immediate reaction was, uh, one, try to get west over the friendly location because there was still this potential that I would have to eject. Um, and, and they were still shooting at us. So uh, there was that. Uh, but it was also get out of Baghdad, get above the weather. I felt like if I still would have to eject, my chances of survival and rescue would be better if I was outside the city. Um, so we just initially kind of made our way south. Uh, my flight lead let our ground troops know that I had been hit. Uh, they wished me good luck. <laughs> and uh, Did you actually hear that call? Yeah, it was kind of funny. I think he had no idea what to say. And it was, uh, so he said, good luck. <laughs> this is awkward. He's like, uh, good luck. Yeah, that was exactly what it sounded like. <laughs> totally awkward. I don't know what to say now, but good luck. Um, yeah, it's funny. I, I don't know why I remember that. But uh, we made our way out of Baghdad. And, uh, you know, at this point, now the call's gone out. We've, we've let kind of all the people know, the rescue helicopters, all the rescue forces. Uh, so they are on call. Um, they've just amped up their alert status just in case I still have to jump out. I mean, I've got 300 miles to go. We have no idea how long this airplane is going to keep flying. Um, and we just really start talking about my next decision, which is do I try to get all the way back home and uh, just get to friendly territory and eject? Or do I actually try to get it back and attempt to land it? So um, huge decision really for me. So I imagine this is where the initial adrenaline starts to wear off and some things start going through your head. Did you, do you remember or did you think about, hey, this might be it? Or what was going through your head at that time period? Yeah, I mean, so there was the initial adrenaline rush kind of getting hit over Baghdad and it was, you know, making it out of that initial situation was like, okay, now I'm, I might actually survive this. Um, but that flight home, I will tell you, was, um, I think, probably the longest hour of my life because... It I was an hour. It was an hour. Oh yeah, it's a lot of time God. to think about whether or not you're going to crash. Um, and, you know, we, we really tried to stay focused. And I know my flight lead, he was really talking me through our emergency procedures and you know, how things were going. We're talking about what's going on in the jet because at this point I'm still trying to figure out what, what is wrong. I mean, there are so many lights, so many things going wrong. My flight lead had pulled up next to me to do what we call a battle damage check, just kind of a look over of my airplane. 
Uh, that's when he told me there were hundreds of holes, a fuselage and tail section, and then that hole about the size of a football in the back horizontal stabilizer where the missile impacted. Uh, the missile sent shrapnel into the fuselage and tail section, uh, which is what damaged my flight control systems. So he, he gives you this update. He does because I can't see it. I've, yeah. We've got these mirrors in our cockpit, but I can't, I can't actually see any of the I don't know if I would have told damage. you that. I would have been like, yeah, you're looking good. Looks great. Yeah. <laughs> Looks great. Uh, he told me some stuff, but he didn't tell me about the amount of damage to my number two engine. The right engine took a significant amount of shrapnel damage, but I, di I didn't know about that till after I landed. Uh, I also didn't know that the back end of the airplane had caught on fire. Uh, I didn't know about that till after I landed. Uh, he also didn't tell me that while we were make our, making our way home that pieces of the airplane were flying off. So he, he did keep some <laughs> things to me uh, or to himself oh my uh, and gosh. keep some things for me. But yeah, um, I think an hour is a long time um, to contemplate whether you're going to live or die, crash or survive. Um, and I really, it was hard not to let those thoughts creep in, right? Like that I may not survive. But I also just really tried to stay focused. I know my flight lead was really helping me try to stay focused. Um, and I just kind of, I don't know, try to tuck those thoughts away, compartmentalize them um, and not think about them uh, because I really just needed to focus on flying. But it was an, an hour's a long time to fly the airplane. And um, wow. yeah, it was, it was exhausting, I think, mentally exhausting to stay focused, but also physically exhausting. It was a very heavy airplane to fly in this backup system. Um, if I let go of the stick, um, the airplane just wanted to roll. So I was constantly trying to fight that. You were compensating the injury from the damage. Yes. Of the and I had emergency jettisoned all of the ordnance off my airplane so that I could climb. Um, and I had a very heavy electronic countermeasure pod, which is hardwired to the airplane out on my left wing. I did not have anything on the right wing. And so it just, it was this heavy weight out there in an airplane that is not very controllable at the moment. So you're just, I mean, you're you're slipping into the wind. You're holding it in one direction to keep it stable. Yeah, and I'm flying with both, you know, one hand on the stick, other hand on the stick, both hands on the stick. Um, thankfully, actually, I remembered some stories from guys, pilots that had flown in Desert Storm. Uh, I read a book uh, about pilots in Desert Storm called Warthog, and I remembered their stories. I had talked to a few other pilots, you know, standard Friday night stories in the bar from our Desert Storm uh, veterans, and uh, I remembered a lot of the stories that they told me about uh, flying in, you know, b with battle damage. Uh, so I knew that when it came time to land, I didn't, I didn't want to be exhausted. I didn't want to be tired, and I wanted to try to land uh, as best I could like normal. Did you come to peace or to terms with any of the things that were taking place as far as you might not potentially make this out? Or were you so focused technically on the task you didn't have time for that? Or or did you was there kind of a a reflection like, hey man, this is it, you know, this potentially could be it and that's okay? Or were you in the or you like mentally just taxed and, and in it? A little bit of both. I think I at least came to terms with my decision. Um, you know, I felt in my gut, I felt based on my training and preparation that I was, that I could lay on the airplane. Um, and I also felt like I could make that decision and change my decision at the very last second. We have a, what we call a zero, zero seat, meaning I can eject at the last second at zero feet, zero knots, and ideally it's successful. Um, so I, I felt I guess I felt confident and comfortable in my decision to try to land the airplane, um, but I also tried to stay super focused on just what I was doing. Um, I felt like it wasn't productive to go to another place where I would think too much about crashing. Now, granted, we talked about it though because we talked about landing at uh, Talil Air Base, mm. um, and which we were uh, had people and equipment at at the time, but there was only one fire truck. So we actually talked about, well, let's let's not go there because if I crash, there's no hospital, there's no, no ambulance, support, yeah. no support. So we kind of talked about it from a very realistic perspective, um, and I tried to just shut the emotional side down. Yeah. Healthy or not, that's kind of what I did. I imagine focused. that's the longest hour of your life. Absolutely. Um, it's a lot of time to think about whether or not you're going to survive. Yeah, that's like it's just you know, it's hard to stay focused too. Yeah, you're like I've been in gunfights where we've gotten blown up, we've gotten ambushed, and then you're in it, and then you're out of it, and you know you're RTBing, you're on the sixty, you're on the Chinook, 
and then you're out of harm's way potentially, but you're still in it. I mean, you're behind enemy lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and at this point in the war, especially in 03, I mean, everything's a potential threat. There's a surface yeah. to air missile threat. There's a SAM threat for sure. Yeah. Um, walk me through the, the final calls and then the visu visualization of the runway as you're making your final approach landing, potentially landing this plane. Yeah. Um, I think that's where it's like everything now, you know, it's go time, right? Like everything that we had done up to this point now it's now, right? It's, it's happening. And I remember we came back into Kuwait, which was another, like, that's now a relief because now I'm at least in friendly territory. If I eject our rescue helicopters are going to be there in minutes. Um, and I, I feel confident about that. Uh, we do a controllability check, kind of mm -hmm. like you're talking about. We make sure I can get the gear down. None of these things are happening normally anymore. You know, I've got to get do an emergency procedure to get the gear down. I've got to uh, make sure I'm ready for emergency braking. All of these things um, we're we're prepping now. Um, the problem also is that it's uh, it's Kuwait and there is uh, like dust, sand everywhere. I was really struggling initially to find the runway, uh, and. It's interesting. I just listened to the audio about a week ago again, um, and I was actually surprised listening to the audio back because I sound so confident. Like in this terrifying moment, I was like, wow, my flight lead had said, he said, all right, Casey, what do you want to do? Are you, do you still want to try to land it? And without a doubt, without a hesitation, I said, yep, like I'm, I'm ready. I, I mean, it's shocking to me thinking back to it because, I mean, it was still this total uncertainty of what was going to happen. Um, but uh, at this point, um, my flight lead actually loses his UHF radio, how we talk to Tower. And so now all the calm goes to me. And I remember just trying to sound so calm on the radio. Like, I'm going to like, I'm going to sound good on the radio. I'm going to sound controlled and calm on the radio because that'll convince everyone myself included, like that I can do this. Uh, so I was super focused on sounding good on the radio. Very important. <laughs> uh, and then it was just like, all right, let's do it. Um, I finally found the runway through the haze. We'd asked the tower to turn up the lights and uh, just kind of prepping for that final approach. And I remember kind of coming into ground effect right at about 60 feet. And I felt like the airplane was just going to flip over on its back. It just started this quick roll you know, it's a moment of like, am I going to, is it going to flip over on its back? Do I have time to eject? And, you know, as I'm thinking these things, I'm also instinctively just pulling back uh, to the airplane to the right. And thankfully it just, it levels out. Uh, and then about 30 feet, uh, this is, I think, where the prayer comes in. And I'm just thinking, you know, please just let me make it, you know, I'm so close now. And remember just really trying to hold it steady. And, uh, and then the main gear and the nose gear hit the ground and huge utter relief i i still struggle to find the word um it was such an immense feeling of relief to be back on the ground knowing you know i hadn't my airplane is still rolling but i i felt like i had survived you know i had made it and the, the rest was the rest i could handle um i think the thing that i remember most to this day is like hearing all the guys from my squadron on the radio because the call when the call went out that i was coming back Everybody went out to the flight line and just in the control tower, in the airplanes, just waiting to launch. And, you know, we all radio discipline went out the window. Everybody was just like, you know, welcome home, Casey. Nicely done. And that was like that was when I knew I was home. That was when I knew I had made it was just hearing all their voices on the radio. Do you remember the first thing that you thought right after you landed? Yeah. Thank you, God. Yeah. As I, I heard myself say it on the radio. I didn't, I didn't even realize I had said it. Wow. But yeah. I was just like, I made it, you know? Wow. I like many people don't have this context. Cause I was in the military when this happened. Uh, I was in the Q course and we heard about it in at camp McCall at Fort Bragg because mm -hmm. Pope air force base yeah. was right there. My, my stepdad was working on active duty at the time there. And we heard about all the things that had happened with this and I remember the initial stories that came out were focused on A-10 pilot, close air support, gets shot up and makes it back home. It's interesting because I don't really remember them say anything about if it was a male or female. Mm -hmm. It was kind of irrelevant. You yeah. know, it's like, and, and I think that's a testament to 
you know, a lot of the way the military operates. It's like, I don't care who's supporting me in close air support. We're all in the fight together. Yeah. And the priorities change where it, we're not focused on all these things, race and ethnicity. We're all brothers and sisters trying to get through each moment in combat together. Yeah. And a lot of us were like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. Like this, this thing happened until I saw pictures of the aircraft and that changed kind of my response to it because it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, people get shot up all the time. You know, like I, we get shot up. That's what happens. But then when you see the aircraft, which we see in the documentary and stories of survival, and you obviously live through, when you get out of your aircraft, because you have a perception of like, man, that, that was bad, and you hear a couple of things from your flight lead. When you get out and you assess the damage that was done, what do you think right then and there? Yeah, uh, I'm shocked. I mean, I, I hop out of the airplane once I get it stopped, and uh, I remember there are all these Marine firefighters there waiting for me from the crash recovery team. And the look on their face, one looking at me and then looking at the damage, I mean, their face is kind of like, what the hell just happened? And I, so I go immediately to the back of the jet and I feel about the same way. Like, I'm just shocked because... I don't know. I didn't know what to expect, but the amount of damage and then just to see it was like dripping with hydraulic fluid. I mean, that's dripping. There are holes all the way up towards the cockpit. Um, you know, it's just shrapnel damage from this missile explosion. Um, there are, you know, part of the airplane is gone and the backside is is black. It's charred and just covered with hydraulic fluids. So, you know, apparently this, when the missile explosion happened, there was likely a fire that charred the backside of the jet, but I'm shocked, honestly, at the amount of damage that the airplane could take and, and fly surprisingly well, you know, it could still keep flying despite all that damage. I was just very impressed and uh, incredibly thankful uh, for the design of the A-10. What was the BDA in assessment of what took place from like the enemy's perspective? I'm sure you guys did a lot of after action and post assessment of that damage is it was it an anti-aircraft gun with a, a missile silo was it like they just vectored into your position and did a strafe and then as you bail they just tracked you like what is there a kind of an understanding of what took place a little bit um at the time um they were trying to bring in a team to do an assessment and the the rule at the time um at least from our understanding was that anybody coming into theater had to be boots on the ground and so that team never made it um so the only assessment that we had was from our on station intel um we know it was a surface to air missile of some sort there's a lot of um there was some discussion of which type it was but i think it was you know they were watching us they're watching our maneuvers. We were we were predictable. I mean, we took that risk, um, knowing that it was a risk because that was the only way we could get in there, to get underneath that bridge, and then uh, try to stay over the friendly location as much as we could. Um, so they, I think they were tracking us, watching us, watching the flares, you know, that we put out of our jet. Uh, we have much better systems these days than we did back then, but at the time, you know, very analog, uh, very manual systems, and I think they were just watching us and got lucky. Is there an estimate on how many rounds that you took um, total? So they, uh, I only know uh, this because I've since understood that our some of our maintenance troops go through a course um, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and they actually counted the number of holes. And I wish I remembered the exact number. So if anybody's listening and knows the exact number, but I think it was over, it was like 625 uh, holes in the airplane. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, they were, I mean... They were all over the place. I was shocked at how far forward kind of that shrapnel damage went up into the gear pod, um, even the front part of the wing. I mean, just big explosion and put some pretty good holes in the airplane. So this is, I'm thinking 30 mic mic or 20. It's no, it's just of, all shrapnel from the explosion of the missile. I mean, the actual gun that hit you. No, I think it was all missile. Oh. Yeah. Holy. Yeah, so missile impacts and shrapnel. And so they're all just... So all that damage is from that missile? Yeah, that's what they that is what they think. It's so and what leads us to, you know, what we assess later as we went in, we found pieces of metal in the oh. airplane. Um cuz it looks like bullet holes. Yeah. But man, it's a surface to air missile maybe they, with flechettes or something that just cuz that that damage, I've never seen any kind of damage like that. It looks like somebody took a 50 cal 
unloaded yeah. at point blank range and just yeah. sprayed the entire. No, I've, everything I've heard, and, and granted, we don't have the official assessment, right? We just yeah. have kind of the initial thought based on what happened and um, and and what we found in the airplane. Um, but that it was a missile that impacted that back horizontal stabilizer and then just sent shrapnel throughout wow. the fuselage and tail. You got hit by a surface to air missile. Yeah. And survived. Yeah. Lucky. <laughs> you have kids now? I do. I have two boys. Yeah. Uh, they Thankfully, no kids at the time. I was married at the time. Married at the time. Um, but no kids at the time. So. How did that first call go <laughs> to your husband? Well, thankfully, my husband was sleeping at the time. So mm -hmm. he was working a different shift. Um, and uh, he woke up. And uh, he's in country, correct? He's in the same country. He's in Saudi Arabia. At Saudi the time. Arabia. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So he he wakes up. Uh, he actually runs into, I think, a two star boss on the, the compound where he was at. And uh, he says, hey, soup. My husband's call sign. He says, hey, I, I heard uh, I heard your wife had a rough day. I'm glad she's OK. And he was like, what? What are you talking about? So he didn't know. Oh, he didn't no. know, but you know, he's a, I think a captain at the time. Oh, so no. he doesn't say anything to the two star. He just kind of <laughs> nods and says, Thank, thanks, sir. And he, so he, you know, and he goes into the, the compound area and uh, I had, I had called and left a message for him because he was sleeping and I had talked to his Intel officer. And so his Intel officer had left him this note that was sitting on his computer um, that said, Hey soup, your wife got hit over Baghdad. Um, she's okay, but you should give her a call. So that is how he found out. <laughs> and uh, you on a know, sticky note. <laughs> on a sticky note. Yeah, I think you know the good side of that is because he is an A10 pilot, he would have known. You know, there was a lot of chatter going on on the secure chat systems, and I think, um, and I went back and read it, and there there is one instance where it says uh, makes a reference to she. So he would have known immediately. He, you know, he knew I was flying. We generally, you know, he knew that kind of my schedule. Uh, but I think it would have been, I can't even fathom what it would have, what it would have been like for him to know that I had been hit and to just be getting those real-time oh, updates man. without knowing. Yeah. So he, he would understand the severity of being in manual reversion for sure. Um, so I'm thankful he was sleeping and I'm thankful, you know, that afterwards we, we had a, private conversation on the secure phone line with 20 of our closest friends on either side, you know, totally <laughs> listening into everything. Um, but at least we could talk. And, um, and uh, I got to see him a couple weeks later when he came through Kuwait uh, on his way out of theater. So yeah, incredible way to find out. Crazy. So um, I imagine this is not the end. This is nearly just the beginning what happens next? How does how does the rest of that deployment go? W what happens? I mean, yeah. I, I feel like that's how you end a career. Like I know, all right, yeah, hanging that's it, up. it. I'm done. <laughs> uh, well, I think uh, one, I came down off off of the incredible adrenaline high, and I think um, so. The next day, on April eighth, uh, my two ship was tasked to sit combat search and rescue alert. I think it was intentional because I think normally when we sit CSAR alert, like. We're sleeping. We're resting. We're just, you know, reading, catching up on sleep. We're out in the alert shack, but we're not doing anything. Well, April 8th, the alarm sounds because an A-10 pilot got shot down right up in Baghdad, right where I was the day before. And, uh, you know, that alarm went off and we just bolted to the jets, you know, we'd throw on our gear, hop in the airplanes and make an immediate takeoff. And um, I didn't have time to think about it, right? There was what? a pilot on the ground. The yeah. next day you're yeah. in an aircraft doing a seesaw. Yeah. <laughs> that's how to get it done though it was yeah you know, i mean i'm glad the pilot is okay we'll put that out there yeah I, you know great way to get back in the airplane because i didn't have time to think about it and the thing i i guess what i did think about was those guys were there for me the day before so i was going to do the same for this pilot and uh thankfully we actually only made it about 30 minutes into iraq um the uh <laughs> We, you know, we're gathering all the information. Where is he at? What shot him down? What's his condition? Where are the closest rescue helicopters? We're kind of going through our standard sequence. And uh, we get the call from AWACS, the airborne controller. And he says, Sandy flight, you can turn around. My flight leads like, we're not turning around. There's a pilot on the ground. So we keep going. Never mind the fact that AWACS has radar. They can see everything that we're doing. Uh, and they're like, all right, Sandy flight, you can turn around. The pilot's been picked up. So he by some miracle ejects ground forces see him see the ejection and uh and go pick him up by wow. ground so we didn't have to do the actual csar um, wow 
What is, I mean, what's your feeling right there? You're like, you don't even have time to think, I imagine. You, you there, There's not even processing of this. You're back in the seat of another aircraft, mm -hmm. and you're taking off, and you're like, huh, this is weird. I was just... <laughs> I was just here yesterday getting shot down. Yeah, it's. I think it was just like you're in go mode, right? And one of your brothers is on the ground, and you're going to go do everything you can to go get him. So I, I think on the way back, I was like, well, that was, you know, going back to Baghdad definitely makes the heart rate beat a little faster. Um, but, you know, there's still war going on, and they need, we needed all the pilots we could get. And uh, I just continued flying for several more months before we redeployed back home. Wow. How many more combat rotations did you wind up doing post this combat rotation? Uh, two or three. Mm. Uh, never back to Iraq, um, always to Afghanistan. So this was my only deployment to Iraq. Um, yeah, a couple, uh, two or three. I have to go back to look at the numbers. Um, I think... You know, for me, I think in that moment of just getting back in the airplane, get back in the fight, getting back to the mission and totally compartmentalizing everything that had happened um, was the way that I handled it. I don't say that that's necessarily healthy. I knew yeah. that at some point I was going to have to kind of open that all up again. And I did eventually once I got home. Um, but for me, it was kind of like I was just focused on our mission, focused on, you know, flying the close air support mission, supporting troops on the ground. It was a really high threat, high risk time for all our ground troops in Baghdad. So we wanted to do everything that we could. Um, you know, things eventually quieted down um, after that. But definitely a life-changing moment, that's for sure. It's an incredible story of survival. It's amazing um, how that went down and that you're able to just reflect on it even. I mean, a lot of people I've talked to in these stories of survival – I mean, a, a lot of them have a difficulty kind of working through that. Yeah. And I, I wonder if the resilience in that is through you getting back in the fight with no hesitancy, right? Yeah. It's like uh, it, they say that, and I've experienced it myself, losing teammates in combat, and then a mission comes down. They're like, it doesn't stop, guys. It's mm -hmm. time to get back to it. And I think that was the healthiest thing for us at the time, especially. Yeah, it, it worked for me, right? It was just um, almost to not think about it. Just I remember a couple days later, I ended up switching to the night schedule and going back to Baghdad. And I realized how much they were shooting at us all the time. We just didn't see it because it was the daytime. So we didn't see it as much. But even flying over that same location as we pressed further north into Iraq, um, you know, it was just definitely brought back memories. I just tried to, I didn't really think about the, the what ifs, right? What all the the bad things that could have happened. I just really focused on um, on the good and what we were doing in our mission. Um, sadly, my airplane, that airplane that I flew, never flew again, though. So yeah. I got back into the flight fight, but the airplane did not. Did um, they? Did they ever? I feel like that should be in a museum or something. But did they? What did they do with that aircraft? Um, so th they first tried to repair it. Uh, a team came out from Hill Air Force Base, um, uh, aircraft battle damage repair team, and. There were a lot of holes, so uh, it was taking a lot of time and kind of weight and balance issues trying to fix it. And we ended up moving our aircraft um, fairly quickly after into Iraq to Talil uh, Air Base. So they just made the decision to scrap it. So they maintenance took every part that they could, the gun, the ejection seat, everything that they could out of the airplane to use as spare parts for other aircraft. Uh, they cut a piece of the tail for me once they were like, hey, it's not going to fly again. Do you want a piece of the airplane? I was like, we can do that. They're like, yeah, it's combat. We can do anything. <laughs> uh, so that that tail, the, the tail flash um, has been in my office uh, throughout my time in the Air Force. And actually a few weeks ago, I just dropped it off at the Smithsonian in uh, Washington, D.C. So it will eventually be on display there in, at the National Air and Space Museum, which is cool, humbling. I don't know. It's crazy to think about something of mine being in a museum with you know, aviators that were my heroes growing up. That's so amazing. That's so amazing. What an amazing story. I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface. Like, I, the, So your book, Flying in the Face of Fear, I assume talks about the specific story of survival, but also your life. Yeah. Yeah, and it goes more into detail about your story, right? Yeah, I mean, I, this, this, uh, this story is probably a, a turning point in my life, kind of that life-defining moment. It's where the book starts, um, but it is... More than that, it is 24 years of military service and a really a reflection on 
the most critical lessons I learned. A lot of them came flying the A-10, but also leading and commanding teams. Uh, and it was just an opportunity for me to reflect a little bit, but also I realized all the stories that I heard throughout my career, you know, that people were willing to share with me, stories that were, you know, people shared mistakes, they shared failures, they shared weaknesses. All those stories, I think, made me a better pilot. They made me a better person. They made me a better leader. And so I feel um, almost a responsibility to share a little bit of what I've learned along the way with the goal of helping others. What an amazing story. How many people, how many women were fighter pilots in A-10s at the time that you were nearly shot down? I don't know the A-10 specific numbers. Um, when I, I think when I walked into my fighter squadron, there were roughly 45 female fighter pilots in the Air Force out of about 3,500. Total. I, total. Uh, I was the only female fighter pilot in my squadron initially. Uh, we ended up getting another female pilot um, about halfway through uh, the war uh, that came over. Um, so there are very few of us. I've always been one, maybe two in the unit, but very few numbers. Our numbers have increased over the past 20 years. I think we're up at about like 130 female fighter pilots in the Air Force, which quite honestly still isn't a lot. Um, but to me, it's always been about credibility in the airplane. You know, the jet doesn't care about the difference, right? The jet doesn't know if you're male or female. So it's all about credibility in the airplane. I love that. Yeah, and I think you're an inspiration for people in general, but I think, especially for women, I, I think yeah. about my daughter and she, she's three and a half, but if she aspired to be something, one, I would never have her join the army like, ever. <laughs> um, it, the default is always like, go be a combat controller, son, and <laughs> honey, go fly airplanes in the Air Force, because yeah. I know how they treat people. It's, uh, it's great. Um, but you're certainly an inspiration for women, but also people in general. Um, I'm excited to give this book a read. Thank you for this, yeah, by the way. Absolutely. Um, but you guys could tune in to Kim Campbell's story, um, both in book form because it's available right now. Uh, we'll put the links down below. But one of the significant things that we've done, if you haven't watched it already, I hope you have, um, the story of survival that we did with Kim Campbell, produced by Phil Craft Survival, uh, is available now on Black Rival Coffee's channel on YouTube. Um, but it is a significant story, and it's it's almost um, it's very challenging to sum up such an impactful story in a short period of time. But the guys did an amazing job, and I appreciate you allowing us to share that story. Yeah, because uh, it's so impactful. Yeah, they did a great job. I did not hold it together in that story hey, as I did here. So <laughs> that's just being real. That's being real. Um, I'll let you close up the podcast, just uh, closing thoughts. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, you mentioned about being an inspiration for young women. And I'll tell you, after this happened, like, I didn't want any of the attention. I didn't want any bit of it. I just wanted to fly. Like, just me, leave me alone. I just want to fly. And a young public affairs officer um, rightfully kind of poked me in the chest and said, you know, ma'am, if you would share this story you have the ability to influence the next generation. And I was like, you're absolutely right. And that changed it for me. It was then it became about sharing the stories, sharing the lessons learned, you know, knowing that I didn't do everything right in my career. You know, I've had my own mistakes and failures and it's been a journey, um, but I've learned a lot of lessons along the way. And that's what this is all about. So awesome. Oh, I think I, I know the perfect way to end this. Um, you wanted to be an astronaut, right? Yeah. Did you ever get, is there ever that in your future? Do you think that's potentially, I mean, with SpaceX and all the things that are going on now, do you ever think that's potentially in your future? Yeah, if future? anybody wants to fund that, Elon, that would be spectacular. Elon, we're looking, <laughs> you have a recruit right here. Um, you know, it's funny. There was a turning point in my career where it was like, I, I loved flying the A-10. Mm. I absolutely loved it. And I, I didn't want to, I wasn't ready to like give that up. And I knew that kind of that pivot to the astronaut track, potentially to test pilot school one, it would mean stopping to fly the A-10, but it was also uh, meant a separation from my husband. Uh, and mm -hmm. at the time we were kind of looking at having kids and starting th that family life. So it was just a, a life choice, a life decision of like, you know what, I love what I'm doing right now. It's been my purpose and my passion. I don't want to give it up with 
the caveat that someday, if somebody asked, I would absolutely say yes. <laughs> there you go. Go fund me. Let's get <laughs> SpaceX. Let's do this, Elon. God, that's so awesome, man. All right. I, I appreciate you, Kim. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much for sharing your story. Absolutely. Guys, Thank see you. the links down below. Make sure you subscribe, hit the notification tab, all that good stuff. Share this story with everybody uh, if you're interested in getting uh, having Kim come out and do speaking engagements or having her come out and talk about her book. Make sure you do pick up her book and support her. Uh, happy Mother's Day to you as well. Thank you. Thanks yeah. so much. I appreciate that. Thank you that. so much to all your mothers out there. Thank you, Mom, for being a mom. Oma. Oh, that's how we say it in Korean. Thank you, guys. Till next time. Peace out. This Mother's Day, don't miss Casey Camel and the Stories of Survival, where she shares her insane story about cheating death after a plane was almost shot down in Iraq. Celebrate warrior moms like her with Black Rifle Coffee's new woman's collection and check out the new service roast, LTO, a coffee dedicated to women who serve. That concludes today's training. Any questions? Woo! Drum titties, boy!